Hi, I'm Josh, I'm a third year. Uh, I'm giving a talk on something that I'm doing somewhat research on in my third year project called Formal Concepts Analysis. Um, it's a very long name, it's something relatively easy. Uh, I hope you guys will understand it by the end. Um, what is FCA? Um, given this definition, it's essentially just a framework where we can take unstructured data and somewhat structure it. Um, we do this by reasoning about the objects and properties, um, or also objects and attributes, um, and we generate this concept lattice. The concept lattice is just a partial order, if anybody remembers that from any module they've done. Um, we'll get on to that in a bit. Uh, one thing you will find in this presentation is I'll have graphs like this um, without the arrows. Uh, that's just because where I screenshot it, they had no arrows. We're always going to assume that the relation is going to go downwards. So we have an arrow. It should, the arrowhead should be here, if that makes sense for everyone. Yeah, OK. Um, so why should we care about structuring unstructured data? Um, I feel like that's, in some cases, a, a rather simple question. Um, but in reality, FCA isn't really used practically in many places, but there's a lot of research showing its practical use could be useful. Um, this lovely, easy to look at graph example I've given here is an analysis of uh, a group of people that are represented by the numbers that you might not be able to see, and events which those people attended are the letters. Um, and what you can kind of see is you have these groups of people that attend similar activities, and we can in this case, just assume they're like maybe the same friendship group, for say, and we can like see these patterns just emerging in this graph. Um, how does it work? So here is a um, nice little matrix of our objects and our attributes. So, for example, a channel is running and it's constant. Whatever constant means, I'm not an expert on bodies of water. Um, and we can generate this matrix for our set of objects and our set of attributes by just, like, it's just true or false. Um, and then we can figure out what their intent and extent is. Uh, what's intent and extent? Good question. Um, putting it simply, the extent of one of our attributes is essentially whatever's true in this column. So for our example, maritime, lagoon, and sea. And its intent is a bit more complicated. We take all the objects that are true, we take those objects' attributes. So for example, we know lagoon is true for, for maritime. We'll take all of its attributes, so natural, stagnant, consonant, and maritime, and intersect it for everything in its intent. So a <laughs> lot, lot of words. Essentially, we will intersect, intersect this row with this row for our case, which is what gives us natural, stagnant, constant, and maritime. And you can do the same for all of them. Uh, I've given another example of stagnant there, where its intent is the empty set. Um, does everyone understand how we get extent and in, um, intents for all our attributes? Yep. Concept lattice. So we have this relation. Please don't turn off. I know it's some scary looking math, but it's really not that much. So essentially, we have our relation A to B. So for example, uh, for example, if B was stagnant and um, A was maritime from our previous slides, um, we can see this does go. And this can be shown by the fact that the extent of um, maritime is a subset of the extent of stagnant. And it just so happens this also is the reverse for um, intention all the time. Um, so that's why we have the and. It's not, that it's not necessary for it to be there, but it, it does work. Um, and we can generate a partial order or a concept lattice like this. So I have a demo um, that I've made, which hopefully you can all can see, where I've got a load of sentences I've made, right? So our objects are going to be the sentence number, for say, and our attributes are going to be the words in the sentence. Um, but we don't really want all of the words in the sentence. Like, what does is and at actually add to our sentence? Not really much. So first, we're just going to um, clean it up a bit. So we're going to remove anything that isn't a word, put it into lo lowercase so it's just all the same. Um, and then that lovely little line there essentially removes what we refer to as stop words, which are those irrelevant words that mean nothing. Um, it runs, and now we get these sentences, which mean the same thing, just without uh, any useless words, really. Um, 
So this next part, we essentially just generate the Boolean matrix where our objects are the rows, attributes are the columns. It's true if the object has that attribute. Um, I'm not going to go over what the actual code does, but we can see we get our little matrix where here black is false and white is true. Um, very big matrix, uh, which I can just chuck into this lovely little library that makes, oh, uh, this, this lovely, lovely looking graph, which brings me back to my slides. What the fuck's going on here? <laughs> um, although it may be a, look a little daunting to look at from the beginning, like the uh, previous graph I had before, but we can see some properties here, right? So, for example, over here, we can see like programming is relevant in these sets of sentences, and then there's also a tangential relation all the way to favorite. And this is because I was talking about my favorite programming languages, which I will not discuss here, if you should have seen it in the sentences while they were up. Um, but in the end of the day, this is not a very easy to look at graph. Nobody wants to look at this. Um, is there a way to make this simpler? Yes. Um, so rather than including all of our attributes, we are just going to take a, a subset of our attributes that represent everything. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, let's just select the, the, the most used attribute because that means we can filter the most um, and then make our matrix smaller. This, in this example, was really bad and won't work because our most used attribute is constant, right? Um, which takes everything apart from puddle. So that means we'll only need one more attribute to represent puddle and then we just have two attributes that's meant to represent all of this, it's not going to look good. So obviously, it has its place, and hopefully its place is with our example we, we did before. Um, so this was our original matrix, as you remember. Now it just looks like this. I don't remember the attributes it actually ch um, chooses, because I just run a Python script, um, which I'll show you guys. Um, it's very ugly. Uh, you'll, you'll, you can look at this at some point, but as you can see, originally we had a 25 by 111 matrix. Now we have a 25 by 12, much smaller and easier to work with, um, which I'll show here, uh, ignore that. Again, pictures of the, the, the matrix, and now we get this little concept lattice, which is much smaller, um, and hopefully we can see a bit more information from it. Um, so this is much easier to look at, uh, and we can pick up similarities, as, uh, similarities like groupings here, so, for example, this could be a grouping here. Football, play, league, play in a football league, play League of Legends, that's what the actual sentences uh, were. <laughs> um, and also, university favorite language, language referring to programming language. I'm a CS student, so of course I'm going to be talking about that. So, as you can see, we can see groupings start to form here, um, which, if I made a bigger data set, would have been uh, probably a bit more informative, but th this, is, this is what I had um, from the time. So, it's a bit better. Um, not amazing, but, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, this is a relatively useful um, application. Uh, so we've talked about how we can analyze our unstructured data. We talked about how to simplify concept lattices. There are other things we can do with them. Um, there's a paper which, uh, if people come and bug me afterwards, I can probably find. It's probably in one of my tabs, where they have a, uh, like a scalar metric on a concept lattice that essentially just says how good of a concept lattice it is, like how well it groups things into different sections. Um, and if you want to play around with the Jupyter Notebook, I do have it on my GitHub. Um, you'll see how badly coded it was. It was made in like 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, once you have a concept lattice, um, how do you analyze it? Because obviously you can see by eye that there are groupings. <laughs> how, how would you do that? Um, this is what I was referring to with the, the paper, which gets like a, a scalar metric of how well the groupings actually uh, work. So for example, this would probably be very bad because I mean, there's not many groupings there and the groupings are rather spread out. We want tight knit groupings. So we'd want basically something that looks like this, but like with a clique, so where all the nodes are all connected to each other would be great. Um, that would be like a preferred. I can show people the paper if I find it, but yeah. I'm still a bit confused by what I need to represent 
Yeah, so um, excuse the really bad formatting. This is just a library that does this for me. Uh, <laughs> In this case, at least, all the nodes really mean something, whether it's a sentence, whether it's a word. So remember, sentences were our objects, words were our attributes. If we go back to the um, this one, I'll put it full screen so people can hopefully see it. Uh, you'll see that there are nodes that have absolutely no labels. Um, so, oh God, I'll show this as well. Um, the way you actually um, generate the concept lattice is rather complicated when you think about it, because not only do you just get the extents and intents of your attributes, which I have here, um, you want to figure out as many different extents as you possibly can, which leads to you just uh, here, I just get the intersection of concept C and D. Um, but of course, I still don't have everything, so you keep on just getting more <laughs> and more and more, and it's very long. And when a node in our graph before doesn't have like a label on it, it's because it's one of these like artificially made um, nodes that represent the attributes above it to, so if I go back to here, so this node here will represent the attributes compiler and programming together, which can be seen in sentence 25, where if I, and find sentence 25. University, my favorite module has either been compiler design or functional programming. So we've got compiler there, we've got programming there. Did so, you have pizza on a concept attribute graph? What would it look like? Do you want to do it? Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, this actually shouldn't be, this should just work with this sentence, this thing. So um, a, a sentence, so how do you want to do it? What are our objects? Yeah, so an, so an object will be a pizza and our attributes will be yeah. the, the toppings. This should just be the same, yeah. Um, we'll make our matrix. So our matrix is a lot fuller now. Um, 